Welcome to the Word and Journey podcast, conversations with friends about stories that shape us and make us think, and some stories that are just for fun. We're busy people reading books in realistic increments. Follow along in the book and join in the conversation, or just sit back and enjoy. Our aim is to unpack the story and offer you things to ponder. Either way, thanks for being here. Hello, everyone. Moses Bernabe here for another episode of the Word and Journey podcast, stories that shape us and make us think, and some that take us on wild adventures across the world and back in time. So what happened here is I discovered on Amazon Prime the series Hunters, produced by Jordan Peele. And I loved it so much from the first episode, I thought, I have to watch this. And then I thought, well, what's more fun than watching a show that's really good is watching a show with a friend. So I drafted my friend Jake Schwartz into watching the show and making commentary on it, which is what you're about to listen to here. Now, fortunately, it's a really wonderful, very smartly written show, and I think you'll love it. And I think you'll love our commentary about it as well. Unfortunately, and not altogether unsurprising, there were technical difficulties. So part of the first episode was lost just for mysterious reasons, but most of it is still here and it's been patched together with a very seamless transition and uh, you may not even notice at all. All that to say, the, the content here is still really fun, really enjoyable. I think you really enjoy the episode and thank you for your patience <laughs> and also thank you to my editor for being a genius. So... Without any further ado, here is the episode in which uh, Jake Schwartz and I really, really enjoy the show Hunters, and we think you will as well. Welcome back to the Word and Journey podcast, conversations with friends about stories that shape us and make us think. And this time we're doing a show. I'm Moses, and back here with Jacob Schwartz. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Nice to see you. It's good to see you too. Yes. What have you been up to lately? Oh, so much. Work has been kicking my butt a little bit in in mostly good ways, in some other crazy ways. But finally got to see one of our warehouses for the first time uh, after about a year of working here at Flex. Uh, we write software for warehouses. And so it's been more of like a blind person trying to describe an elephant sort of situation. So it's been really good to actually have seen a warehouse and I understand, oh, this is how things are going on and stuff. So that was really cool. Let's see. I had bought the house and moved in before we finished our last series. Um, but I have entered a new phase of home ownership, and I feel like a real homeowner because now I am uh, beginning what will be probably a years long war against an invasive plant. Oh, yes. Ivy? Uh, no, no, uh, it's called Japanese knotweed, and it is a cousin to bamboo, I believe. Okay, and these it grows super fast, and um, it can <laughs> it can grow up to twenty feet deep. Uh, its root system, and it can grow back from like point two of a gram of rhizome. So y- you can't just like pick it; it's it's pretty bad. So uh, even even like the hippie granola sites that I follow, because I don't try and I don't want to use pesticides or herbicides if I don't have to. We're kind of like, yeah, you really need to probably use Roundup here. Ooh. And it will still take four years. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so I, I feel like a real homeowner now. I have a plant, an enemy that I'm... I'm <laughs> so now it's been good. It's been really, really good. That's great. Yeah. No, I was going to say, I was going to say, according to our type, well, you bought this house back in 1984. Uh, (laughs) The series. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I'm sad about your invasive plant. Um, Yes, we don't have that, thankfully. Although there was some bamboo in our chicken yard, um, but it's like not that kind, I don't think. And then there's just like the, and then there's just the, the endless inevitable mint everywhere yes that comes up everywhere and blackberries there's literally uh in the back in, in my backyard there there's like this wooden fence that faces the field and we'll just see like these blackberries just like kind of like encroaching over it uh if it was like in time lapse or something it would look super ominous and uh creepy who's the not tim curry not tim newman um 
Oh my gosh, who's the who's the the director that did like Edward Scissorhands? Oh, Tim Burton. Yes, him. Yes, we have a BlackBerry patch. I think worthy of Tim Burton just like creeping and encroaching <laughs> over our back fence. I love it. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Anyway, seeking and encroaching. So we are tackling another story. Uh, this we are watching the Amazon Prime show Hunters with Al Pacino, Logan Lerman, and Lena Olin, and some other fun people. Season one aired in 2020, so kind of recent, created by David Weil. And the IMDb blurb says, In 1977, New York City, a troubled young Jewish man bent on revenge is taken in by a secret group of Nazi hunters fighting a clandestine war against the cabal of high-ranking Nazi officials in hiding who work to create the Fourth Reich. Dun, dun, dun. It's really good. I I think I saw ads for this series, but until you had asked me to join you on this uh, small part of the podcast, I had no idea uh, what the show is. Yeah, I didn't. Um, I I'd seen the the blur pop up, and I was like, "Oh, that, that's cool." I mean, I, I mean, I like some of the actors. Uh, and then I was bored one night without anything else to watch, and then turned it on. And yeah, I I got hooked like pretty pretty quickly into it. I, I my my thought is like this feels very smartly written, and I was just appreciating the character interactions. Uh, yeah, so we, I guess we like it. Uh, yeah. I guess a lot a lot of the reviews are kind of terrible, but then it's also won a lot of awards. So so I guess we can <laughs> tackle the question: Is this show any good? And by what rubric? <laughs> I kind of like it. Would you like to narrate some of the? first episodes or sure um yeah so we're we're covering the first four episodes right i did do that right yeah there there were a number of times when we were doing 1984 whereas i definitely read the wrong sections so yeah uh episode one opens in 1977 we actually see this couple entering into uh like what looks like a pool party and uh he the um guy is angling to be like uh, or just got hired to be working for the secretary of state and basically his wife starts freaking out when they see the secretary of state because spoiler alert the secretary of state of course his name is biff is a secret nazi and that's all i could like i've never played the game secret nazi there is an actual tabletop game but that's all i could think of watching this entire series (laughs) and so the um the nazi biff or the butcher uh, ends up killing like everybody there, including his own family, because they found out his secret. And so that's it's a really nice opening, um, really great love, like light show. And then we cut over to Brooklyn, which is where our our titular or not titular, but our uh, lead character is Jonah. They're exiting from a movie theater, and basically, what happens a little bit later down the road is his grandmother gets murdered that he's living with. So he's all on his own. He's trying to figure out who killed his grandma all these sorts of things. And then at the same time, all of this starts to play out where you're cutting over to Cape Canaveral and there's a, there's been a murder effectively that agent Morris is called in on. And she's already having a really tough time at the FBI because she's a black woman. So she gets sent out to Cape Canaveral for this like low level job. They're just trying to get her out. Right. And it turns out to be a Nazi who got gassed in her own shower very ironic and so she starts she begins this investigation and she begins to start pulling open more threads of again secret nazis in a ton of spaces within the u.s government within major institutions like nasa etc and she finds or she ends up getting this sort of cleaner um coming after her and not the janitor type so Switching back over to Brooklyn, we now have these two parallel stories going. Jonah tries to go after the killer, uh, and we find out through his uncle Offerman, or Meyer Offerman, that this killer was probably a Nazi. And Jonah tries to go after the guy. He's running a toy shop, secret Nazi again sort of stuff, and the Nazi almost kills him. Uh, And then Meyer Offerman shows up and stabs him in the neck. So that's the end of episode one, effectively, and and ends with Jonah getting introduced with the other hunters. There's this whole set of like eight people, I think, 
and episode two is where like episode one feels very very serious this whole series the series is very serious but episode two is where you hit the quentin tarantino vibes and i'm here for it oh my gosh am i here for it uh so like the dark the dark bloody humor this cast call of um all of the different hunters the so al pacino is playing meyer offerman like the head of this group um we have saul rubinek carol kane josh randor all like some of my favorite actors carol kane is a treasure uh you'd seen her in a number of different parts um the first thing that i really noticed her in was the unbreakable kimmy schmidt she's the kind of crazy uh drug dealer neighbor (laughs) saul rubinek from warehouse 13 josh randor was ted from how i met your mother it was kind of crazy uh, but the whole the whole cast is just absolutely great again i'm very much appreciating that like the oh sorry i wrote carnival instead of canaveral that's why i was confused so <laughs> <laughs> up into Cape canaveral um and we get one of my favorite lines uh agent morris is banging on the the head detective's door at like five o'clock in the morning in florida and some neighbor comes out and like yelling at her and she turns around and says i'm hungry i'm in florida don't mess with me <laughs> I, i've i've been there in in florida in, or in, hungry at 5 a.m at this point she's she's just barely finding out that there are nazis and that she's investigating the murder of one um you know this it was this little old lady right and she brings up a really great quote um monsters can be little monsters can be old monsters can be us which was just like really, really kind of powerful and deep makes you think. She's got some good one-liners. And at this point, we get a little bit of background into how the hunters were put together uh, from the matchmaker, uh, a friend of Meyer Offerman's, who, uh, in akin to matchmaking lovers, uh, she would matchmake hitmen for people. <laughs> also, another great character. Uh, here we find out a little bit more about what's going on. Uh, with the hunters, they actually go after another guy, and um, it's at this point that Jonah is really conflicted. He doesn't really know this Nazi. He doesn't. He hasn't been directly affected by him. And uh, through you know the classic trope of like, oh, give me a glass of water, and then the Nazi headbutts him and tries to escape, and they end up having to kill him. Uh, you know, he's going through this really tough psychological deal with like. Okay, I was just an accessory to murder, and you know, apparently it was this horrible Nazi that would basically hold singing contests and murder everybody uh, who didn't perform well. But like again, this this kid didn't have anything to do with it. And then episode three, uh, <laughs> right. so we we still see the cleaner coming after Morris. You know, he's getting closer, getting closer, and then cutting back to Brooklyn, we see Jonah really kind of dealing with the struggle just you know there was a murder he's he's leaving the hunters after meyer offerman has uh Brilliant. sorry some technical difficulties hey oh moses here again and this is where we come to the first break uh, marking our brief technology failure but it was very brief and right now we will get right back to the content as if nothing ever happened thank you for listening and we hope you continue to enjoy yeah, that's super dicey. I guess I was thinking the. I guess our, I don't know, my perception of like the the the, the more highfalutin artists are like more like the the, the indie singer songwriters or like the, the indie writers. Uh, you know, again, you know, so so not like your 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 Stephanie Meyer, Justin Cronin, sort of like mainstream like you know pop novelists, but more like like the Tom Spanbauer sort of like novelists who like are. Well, maybe not even Cormac McCarthy anymore. He's too big. But like, uh, you know, these people who like don't follow the conventional rules of music or, or writing, and um, maybe and probably don't produce as much content, as much volume, but more interesting content. I don't know. There's like a little bit of a snobbishness that can go with that sometimes. Although sometimes a more interesting craft also. I'm a little out of my competency zone talking about stuff like that. But why? So remembrance. Why is it important to remember? Uh, that's uh, a really huge theme. I know certainly in, in our in our show, <laughs> we're still talking about hunters. Meyer certainly brings up this idea of remembering quite a bit. Uh, you know, we need to remember this stuff happened to us. This is our culture. Um, you know, we would preserve our memories. Um, like when they discover like the treasure trove, there, there's a sense of, 
um one, one of the characters i think it might have been um the black ladies this is a terrible i can't remember her name um but i think it was her she was like how many stories are in this room and it's just this really really poignant quote it's a, yeah why it's must we remember things question, like this right? i think our our generation's nearest analog um in the states and i say nearest not that it is the same by any stretch uh would be the attacks on 9 11 right um we see stuff every year um remember 9 11 uh, especially around the day and so that's that's the closest thing that at least i have to grasp on that um and my my thoughts on that particular remembrance are they shift i i will say i won't i won't i won't prop myself up and say that they're complicated but they certainly shift and so you know is remembrance important arguably yes because if you know if those who uh, fail to learn from the past are doomed to repeat it i guess you know where where does that idea of letting go and moving on come in and i can't say that for any other group i can't say that for survivors of the holocaust and the generations that followed them it's a really tricky thing you know and this this so this show couples the idea of remembrance with the idea of you know justice or at very least vengeance and i'm curious to see where where everything continues to go right in the show we're about we're a little less than halfway through the first season and so it's you know in in this particular show's case and this touches on another subject that i'd love to get into a little bit as far as history goes um you know there are nazis that are infiltrating the states and the and the hunters don't know that and that's fair so they're but they still know like these nazis escaped the war um these nazis who committed horrible crimes like the music guy who would kill nine out of ten contestants on his musical singing show that's that's horrible and it would be like a at least a weekly, if not a daily thing, you know, all of the, the doctors that performed horrible, brutal experiments on people, that sort of stuff, you know, so there's that idea of justice and it's intertwined with remembrance because these, these Nazis are in the States and they're like, we, the hunters know about it by the fourth episode, at least a little bit, they have inklings of plots. Like they're not just there and not doing anything. Like they're, they're plotting to bring about probably the fourth Reich. And so it's it's a tricky subject to be sure. And the idea, like bringing it back to more current times in 9-11, remembrance can also be used and abused by the people in power, um, arguably. And, you know, we don't need to go too much into the politics on this. Our cultural fear and t- cultural touchstone of the, the attacks that happened on 9-11 and how we remember all of that have been weaponized to get people to vote and do things that they might not necessarily normally do. Um, and it's, you know, fear is a powerful thing. Oh, these people will, if you mm-hmm. don't vote us in, they're just going to do it again or mm-hmm. whatever, whatever is used for that. And so it's, it's a tricky thing because at what point does, mm-hmm. you know, what, at what point do we yeah. move on? And does, and this is another thing. Oh yeah. my God, sorry. I'm there, just like pulling in other strings of things that have been going on. Yeah. A little bit. Um, but like, point does forgiveness yeah. And scripture doesn't teach the idea of forgiving and forgetting. <laughs> forgiving doesn't mean like I'm, or, and not forgetting doesn't mean I'm going to always hold this thing against you, but it doesn't mean that we're going to f- forget and just pretend like it didn't happen. We, we see this right now, un- unfortunately, and it grieves me a lot. Um, I don't know if you heard about the the report from the Southern Baptist Convention. I'm Orthodox now, so. <laughs> so. That's fair. Uh, it's It's, <laughs> Basically, they were tra- They had a list of 700 people in leadership, primarily ministers from my understanding, um, that had engaged in, at the very least, sexual misconduct, but often sexual abuse, mm. and did nothing about it. Ooh. But they, like, we saw instances coming out shortly after that where there were calls, well, you just need to forgive them and move on. I'm like, in, some, in many of these cases, they were minors. Like, yeah, forgiveness is one thing, but... Forgiveness doesn't mean a lack of consequence. Forgiveness doesn't mean yeah. that you know, we just we just let you keep doing what you're doing, especially in in places of power, right? And so that's again huge topic. Um, I just you know pulling pulling in concepts of remembrance and forgiveness, and you know what does uh-huh. that mean? 
Yeah, remembrance, forgiveness, justice. They're the, this interesting trifecta, and it and it's fa- and it's fair to bring in the forgiveness one because I mean I was I was thinking that a little bit too. Uh, you know, especially watching. So here's here's my other you know tangent for today is you know what what is the difference between vengeance and justice and like how does that because we yes, especially within Christian thought, forgiveness is one of the supreme values, and mm-hmm. there's very much the sense of like if if we do not practice forgiveness toward people like we don't get to experience it uh for ourselves and and i don't some more thought some smarter orthodox people than me should you know, say if that specifically means i like i don't know that that means like we we can't be saved like at all but like we certainly i don't know it's important it's important for us to forgive right. and it's it's very it's it's extremely vital for our spiritual walk and so practicing it even in the face of incredibly bad things is really essential. And of course, mm-hmm. you know, the, you know, certainly the New Testament writers who are writing this, they are the Christians who are experiencing the Roman persecution. So, I mean, it's, we don't usually, you know, I mean, it's not as condensed as, like, as the Holocaust, but yes, I mean, millions of Christians were, were slaughtered and persecuted mm-hmm. within the first few centuries of the church. And it was in that culture, that rhythm, where they were talking about, you know, practice forgiveness, pray for your authorities, respect your authorities, live peaceably. So, yeah. so not those aren't sentiments coming from like rich, affluent people necessarily. So, um, so, so it's an important thing, but, but it's also complicated because there are all of these injustices happening and you know, thinking about remembrance, I guess one of the features of the Holocaust that stands out to me, I think is the way that at least I mean for sure from like like American perspectives, it seemed to come out of nowhere. When I when I hear commentary on it, it, there's always a sense of, you know, the way that like, you know, the you know, how Hitler's dogma would just kind of got slipped in there. And it was this idea of like a lot of good people did nothing a lot mm-hmm. of times. And then all of a sudden, you know, all of a sudden this thing was here, this Reich was here, and these atrocities were happening. And uh from there I feel like this idea of remembrance becomes important and is very highly valued in the sense of like this caught us off guard. This happened. We can't let this happen again. We have to remember it so we can watch for it and be aware of it. Uh, and I guess a little bit with like the nine 11 event as well. I mean, that that's like a, a different kind of event. I mean, right. still caught us off guard kind of, but there is, I guess, depending on <laughs> whether or not it was an inside job, who knows, you know, conspiracy theories uh but there yeah i think the this idea of remembrance becomes important with the sense of this atrocity happened it can't happen again how do we keep it from happening again we have to understand why it happened we have to watch for things that are like it i mean it's essentially like a trauma response um i mean that happens on a micro scale you know a person goes through something you know painful scary overwhelming and our system orients around anything that resembles that so we can so we can avoid it and that's where we get this concept of like anxiety or hypervigilance and yes it can be taken to an unhealthy extreme but it's the essential mechanism it's a protective one in that i'm thinking that it's important to remember where we came from so we know what's driving us and so we know that what burdens we're carrying um and there are I mean, we get into this idea of like generational trauma epigenetic genetic trauma um there's a sense of you know legacy burden that we carry from you know the holocaust and everything that happened with it and until we're able to really face and understand what that burden is we can't really lay it down or heal from it we can only try to ignore it or pacify it or try to explain it away If we really want to face the darkness within and undo it, we have to be able to face it. And that comes through a lot of this idea of remembrance. I think though, what, you know, Meyer, Meyer, the character, he talks about remembrance a lot. And I was thinking about how that concept shows up in, in the Old Testament, for sure. You know, God commands the children of Israel to build memorial stones to... But it's it's not specifically to remember. Here's a bad thing that happened. It's more to remember. Here's how God showed up with these pe- with His people. Here's how God was working all along. And in a, in a similar way, you know, in in uh, you know in in Orthodox Christian thought, when we talk about like the Eucharist, you know, do this in remembrance of me. It's not 
just remembering, oh yeah, Jesus did this thing once one time, but it's more particularly through the ritual of it, like calling into the present time, this event that happened. And so kind of ritually recreating and participating in the events of our salvation, which is a healing thing. It's a connective thing. It's a unifying thing. And I think that's something that I, I mean, certainly in the, in this show, I, I don't see that that's an aspect of remembrance that's brought out. It's not meant as like a healing thing, although it is very much a unifying thing. And, and you were mentioning, you know, like the politics around 9-11 and, you know, for, for better, or for worse, I think they're, they're onto something really real, like uh, using fear or using a shared struggle or having a culture rally around this commonly remembered thing there's a unifying aspect to that. So it is very powerful in that way. So I guess when we think about like, what, what is remembrance? Why does it happen? Or what's going on when it happens? There's, I guess maybe we, it, uh, we could be cautious or at least intentional about what we're choosing to remember or what we're choosing to remember through ritual because it, uh, we're, we're bound together with something in that where we're participating in something. And I guess we ought to be a little intentional about what we want to ritually participate in. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, understanding the concept of ritual too, right? That's, it's, that's not a word that is commonly used in our rhetoric today. Uh, but, you know, the, the ritual of, you know, remembering 9-11, the ritual of so many, so many different things, you know, and, and seeing what that ritual is getting us, right? Like so often it seems that the, you know, bringing it back to 9-11 again, the ritual of 9-11, what, what is that doing to the people and doing for the people? Um, often, you know, we've seen it as this foothold for, uh, for racism, right? For, you know, blaming an entire culture of people, not even just one country, but an entire culture of people. Um, again, I'm, I am vastly overgeneralizing anyways, the, the peoples of the Middle East for something that a, a handful of people and not just, you know, those who flew the, who flew the planes, but you know, the, the leadership and et cetera, it's not, it's not just those four, but it was, you know, a larger thing, but you know, to blame, <laughs> to blame Brown people for, for what happened on nine eleven is, is absolutely ridiculous. Um, in the same way that it's just as ridiculous to blame, um, all white people for, for certain tragedies that happened like the Unabomber or whatever, like it's, it's so much of that. And, um, I, th I think one of, one of the things that we can do is just really take a long, deep look at those issues. And again, uh, um, reflecting it from the other side. Um, one of the things that I always try and bring up when I, you know, when I hear aspects of that, of like, you know, like, oh, those damn Catholics or whatever. Um, and many of the scandals and abuse stories coming out of, Catholic church. I'm like, okay, so why do you think it's all Catholics? It's just as ridiculous to call out, uh, say all Protestants are evil due to what just happened at the SBC. We have to understand that. We have to understand that like, uh, people groups are not a monolith that, um, right. yeah, well, yes, I don't agree. And I guess that that circles back to this idea of like responsibility. Uh, we could say, uh, you know, you know, my case, I'm, it's, okay. So, so I'm an Orthodox Christian, uh, you know, am I responsible for the, you know, what's going on between like the Orthodox patriarchs and like Russia and Ukraine, which, I mean, I don't fully understand all that's going on, but I know that like, that that's a, a factor in all that's going on is there's, there's some Orthodox, you know, drama going on over there. Like, am I responsible for that? I'm like, well, A, I don't understand it, but I guess, you know, they're also my people. So in a sense, I am, I guess, by de facto called to, to sometimes answer in some way answer for them, or at yeah. least I think, I think taking responsibility is a whole different subject than blaming uh, an entire group. Like I, I need to take some responsibility for what happened as part of the SBC, not only because was I working within that denomination, but they are part of the larger Protestant group and a large, a part of the larger Christian group at the same time. And, you know, dealing with, again, the, the systemic uh, things that allowed those people to be in power in the first place like, are the same systemic things that I often benefit from that I take for granted and I have no idea that are going on and that I'm not actively choosing, but I must choose to understand that mm. and then figure out what to do with that later. Yeah. 
Yeah, there could be, well, like we were saying earlier, like, like you know, minimal case effort, you, you work to actively inform yourself about what's going on. And that would be, yeah. that'd be a good stuff. Um, but the other thing, and this is something I pulled out a little bit from like my work as a counselor, you know, counselors are a part of our education is we're told you, you represent the field and that's part of your ethical duties to represent the field. Well, uh, so, so we could say, yes, <laughs> well, there are a significant number of counselors who are disciplined, disciplined, <laughs> uh, and lose their license for sexual misconduct. Um, that's obviously not all counselors and it, and counseling is not a bad profession or, or an evil group of people because some people have done evil things with it, but it, it is very incumbent upon me and uh, and others to be be really sure we don't follow that example. And if you know, however bad the bad example is, like I need to be that much gooder and more on top of things. Uh, and I would say, you know, within my Christian circles too, and within I am hoping to run in writer circles also at some point. But you know, I have however yeah however however bad the bad example is, like I need to be that much more good as a good example. And that's, I guess that's, that's my work. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I must be a good upstanding white person. <laughs> so. Yeah. This has been fun. Long ramble. And I'm realizing we rambled uh, longer than I planned. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and also the Eastern sun is coming up and blinding me because I'm facing East in my window. Yeah. I have this lovely backdrop of just pure light. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's your halo, your preview of a halo. It's good. Perfect. But yeah, thanks for, for rambling some on some political and historical themes and a little bit about a little bit about the show too. So um <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was good. Thank you for having me. Of course, of course. For next time, do you wanna do so there's I guess six more episodes. Do you wanna do like a four and two or a three and three? Three and three sounds good. Three and three sounds good. Okay. We're going to end on a cliffhanger for the next set, no matter what. So Right. So uh, we'll just deal with that. I'll have to go to counseling for that. Uh, we have many, many issues that come with cliffhangers. Anyway. Right? Right? At least the second season is coming soon. Yeah, yeah. That'll be good. Or at least it's in production. Yeah. Soon is a relative term. Right. So anyway. Well, thank you, listeners, for following. And uh, please do consider visiting the Patreon and subscribing because I need some dollars. If you want to keep the podcast coming, give me some dollars. So anyway, I love you all. And goodbye. Bye. <laughs>